Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome back to the second session where we are going to be taking a look at dua number two. Mm -hmm. So in this dua we are focusing on praying for others and this is actually a very natural state you know human beings in our fitra in our innate nature we are created to care for others to want to pray to want the best for others and when there when you don't want to or when you feel like there's a blockage there then there is something wrong with our fitra. That means we are not connected to our innate nature. So by, 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 by default, we want what's best for others as well. And that's where this dua comes in. Yeah. And I love that this dua is basically, a dua in general is an excellent way to achieve our halal desires, not only for ourselves, but for the people around us. And there are two aspects to it. So dua in itself is saying those words and praying to Allah. And this is because of the natural system of cause and effect. When, you know, there is always cause and effect to every uh, action. And when we look at the main cause of everything, and that's Allah. So naturally, to get the effect, to get our legitimate desires met, we will ask the true cause, which is Allah. Mm -hmm. But then the thing is that Allah is the main cause, but we are his agents. Mm. So for us to be able to pray for others, but then we can also actively do things for others. So we are acting as his agents at, on, on this earth. So it's very and so important to in that all. case, yeah, so in that case, then the why is just one step. Mm -hmm. And then the next step is to actually take action. And that is where a lot of practically implementing this dua comes into play. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So let's begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman yeah. ar-Rahim. The first mm -hmm. line is Allahumma adkhil ala ahlil qubur surur, which mm -hmm. means, oh Allah, gladden the people of the graves. And there are lots and lots of things that we can do for this. And I think a lot of them we know, you know, like praying for them, reciting a turakat salah, doing istighfar for them, reciting seven inan zalnas, when we yeah. pass by the kabrastan, reciting 11 calls. So mm -hmm. because this is quite commonly known, we're not going to spend too long on it. And we're going to move on to the second line. But this is a, this is an easy one to demonstrate the fact that we can verbally pray. Yeah, we are agents, and we can do things that will that will take effect, that will help them. You know, yeah. truly, yeah. yeah. So the next really? line is Allahumma aghni kull faqir, which mm. means Oh Allah, enrich every poor person. And the focus that we want to actually do on this line, we all know, you know, the practical things that we can do on the surface level to help poor people donate money, give to the food bank. But we want to focus here on the word kulla, which means all or every. Mm -hmm. And this is the bit that Fatma and Ji were talking about, where it's not just about ourselves, is it? No. So, you know, that makes us think, so should we be praying for, you know, enriching everybody? What about the people who are not believers? Then what about the people who are hypocrites? Or what about the people who will actually go on to do more harm than good? Should we be praying for them as well? What do you think? So the beautiful thing is my instinct would be like, no, of course we don't pray for them. Yeah. Like, why should we? But actually when we were looking at the interpretation of this dua, it was saying, yes, we do pray for them too. And not only do we you know, there's a spiritual dimension that we pray that Allah guides them and we pray that Allah helps them find the truth. But actually, we also pray for their material gain. So we actually also pray that they get material gains, but not just for the sake of material gains. So they get enough that they need, that they're not so focused on trying to find like the basics of food and water so that they can then focus their attention on coming to Allah, which I thought was yeah pretty amazing it's a very interesting um aspect of this this particular phrase definitely yeah. mm -hmm. the prophet's example also comes here like right we know that um the higher levels of this praying for everybody and and also the disbelievers is like the ahlul bayt and the prophet they cared so much for the people around them that it caused them distress when the people around them would not believe and we have, right, in the Quran where Allah says, you know, Allah is trying to console the Prophet. Um, and he says, and, and therefore do not consume yourself in grief for them due to their disbelief, which I thought was, wow, like our empathy for people around us yeah. needs to be honed. So that's like how, you know, the Prophet is referred to as Rahmatul Alameen. He's a mercy for everybody. Yeah. And I love this um, hadith that's, you know, attributed to, 
um, Prophet Isa Islam, where he says, be like the sun that shines to the sinful and the virtuous. Wow. So, you know, the mercy that's, that's, that's for everybody. Wow. In the same way, that's how we, how we um, pray for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Moving on to the next line. Allahumma ashbi' kulla ja'i. And I just, I love this one. Because it means, oh Allah, satisfy every hungry one. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking about how hunger is a widespread problem. And usually there are two causes that we give to hunger. One is the person the, who is hungry often can bring this hunger on themselves, which I thought was really interesting that sometimes it's the sufferer themselves. And we'll talk about why. Mm -hmm. But the other reason is the mm -hmm. you know, natural phenomenon or society and the situation around them. And looking at mm -hmm. the, the person themselves, so, yeah. Well, yeah, we have to look at what we can control, right? So um, I was looking, I found this really interesting that if it's up, coming from ourselves, where is it that coming from? Mm -hmm. So there's things that, we're, that things that we are doing or things that, you know, our actions are actually limiting our, our risk or limiting our sustenance. And there was a list that we, we came up with, wasn't there? Yeah, so things like and i'll go through the list and i guess ask yourselves which one of these that yeah. you know are we doing mm -hmm. expression of greed sleeping mm -hmm. between maghrib and isha sleeping between fajr and sunrise severing relationships with our relatives um cursing one's children eating in the state of lying down which yeah. many of us can do yeah um not praying for our parents mm -hmm. backbiting overeating yeah being extravagant Eating while walking, I thought. I was going to say, I was wondering if you came yeah. up with that. Yeah, that yeah. was amazing. Yeah, eating whilst walking. Uh, laughing <laughs> excessively, especially near graves um, and gatherings of the le uh, learned. Uh, mm. Not lending money to mm. one who is in need. Um, and looking like finding the faults of people. Yeah. So I think within that list, there's lots of that we can already do, which mm. are not necessarily big things. And we can open the gateway to this risk from our from yeah. Allah, can't we? Yeah, definitely. So these are things that we are doing that is stopping the risk from coming to us. But then on the other hand, there are things that we can do also to, mm. to bring down that risk. And I've noted a couple of things here, which was um, to always make sure that you are in the state of Tahara. Mm. Okay. And also to really inculcate good manners and akhlaq. Wow. And that brings about risk. So yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Now there's also a deeper we dimension, to, isn't there? Yeah, go yeah. on. Yeah, go on. We moved on to a different dimension of hunger, which you yeah. can go on to explain. So the what I really liked about this is, as well as food for the body, there's food for the soul. Mm. And in Surah Abasa, um, Allah says, "Then let man look at his food." And Imam Jafar Sadiq was asked, "Well, what does this mean?" And he replied that the knowledge that he acquires, what somebody should ask themselves, where do we actually acquire it from? What's the source? So in this um, example that's given, we can see that that food that is looked at is actually knowledge. So the food for our soul, the hunger that we are experiencing could be hunger for knowledge. Yeah. And I think especially, you know, um, for our audiences at, and at that age, that hunger for knowledge is mm -hmm. so important to, to, um, you know, f fester it, to let it grow and to, you know, to sort of let it take you in different directions because it's, it's a time that you should be thinking outside the box, you know. Um, we were talking about how entertainment is just so easy to consume and it takes up all our time, whereas there is an actual thirst. There should be a thirst for knowledge. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about, you know, broadening reading, just... Um, uh, you know, liking different things on, on social media. So it's not just the normal kinds of posts, following things that are actually knowledgeable and informative and will help you. And, and even, it doesn't have to be a lot, does it? No, no. Yeah. Yeah. Just a small, uh, like a short TED talk a day or yeah. listening to, you know, uh, and in, or reading an inspiring post or just making sure that you're subscribed to the right so sorts of pages yeah. which develop, you know, the, the education aspect. Because you know, I think... Yeah, I was just going to mention that in the, the teenage brain just now, mm -hmm. there is such an uh, ability for the teenage brain to specialize mm -hmm. in something. And so if they channel their energy 
in this uh, seeking of knowledge, there is so much to be gained, which perhaps you and I, Fatima, are a little bit past. <laughs> Definitely. It's such a fruitful time. Like, you know, whatever you sow, you reap. And this is the time to sow ideas. And, you know, as I get older, we talk, you, know, you know, do you think outside the box? And, you know, you, you don't know how to think outside the box until you read and you learn outside the box. And that's where it all comes in. Yeah. And I was going to say, you know, the fourth Imam said this, that a part of your day should be for gaining knowledge. So that includes religious knowledge and just, yeah. you know, one thing that you read on social media and that could be it. Yeah. Like you said, something small. Yeah, something small. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on to <laughs> the next line. Um Oriyan. Oh Allah clothe every unclothed one. Now this has a, a basic meaning and a deeper meaning as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we talked about the basic meaning of, you know, clothing and how clothing is um, for modesty and then clothing is to beautify. And then that can be implemented or interpreted to be, um, sorry, in intrinsic as well, can't it? Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. the, the clothing for modesty basically covers our immodest or our, you know, shameful parts of us, uh, uh, so to speak. And when we look at the deeper meaning of this, we look at, well, basically, are we covering or are we exposing the deeper parts of us so for example if we are committing misdeeds and on the day when everything will become bare and all of our deeds will be out for everyone to see will we then feel shame like if you know as if we go out naked in the on the streets it'll be like that on the day of judgment so what kind of clothing do we need to attire ourselves with now so we don't feel shame on the day of judgment and that's basically even going back to the other thing you were saying about hunger, good deeds, right? Uh, our akhlaq, our, all of these things are very much interlinked. And just the overarching umbrella of being God conscious of taqwa. Yeah. And yeah. you know, the Quran tells us that the best clothing is your clothing of taqwa. Yeah. You know, so we are actually praying, you know, oh Allah, clothe, clothe everyone who needs clothing. But we ourselves, we need to pray for that for ourselves as well. And this is the clothes of taqwa. And that's the second aspect of clothing, right? The beautification of ourselves with a deeper meaning. Yeah. And so uh, we, we'll, there's quite a lot more lines um, in the dua, but we don't have time to go into each one of them. And uh, when, we were, when we were deciding which ones to cover, we thought we'd cover the ones that are most applicable. So the next one and the last one that we're going to cover for today is Allahumma faraj an kulla makroob. And carb actually... The word makru comes from karb. Karb is what karbala comes from as well. It actually denotes deep anguish. Okay. And when we think about the sources of anguish, what causes anguish? There's actually a, a huge variety of causes and that can vary with people and circumstances. So sometimes it could be poverty. Sometimes it could be cancer. Sometimes it could be not getting the right grade. Sometimes it could be, you know, not knowing the path that you want to take in your life. So when we're looking at ourselves, and when we're asking Allah to relieve this anguish, and sometimes we don't have control over these things. We can't remove an illness as, as yeah. such. But one thing we need to remember is no matter what the situation, one thing we can do is get close to Allah. And actually proximity to Allah is the source of true happiness. And there's an ayah in the Quran which demonstrates this perfectly in, in uh, Surah number 10, ayah number 62, where he says, Surely the friends of Allah, i.e. the ones close to Allah, neither, neither fear, fear nor grieve. Hmm. So that just shows that if we just have our goal as, you know, making Allah happy and, and trying to get close to Allah in our deeds and our actions, then inshallah that closeness to Allah will alleviate the suffering that we're going through, even if the circumstance doesn't change, which I thought is is yeah. really powerful. And to accept that life will have different circumstances, the ups and downs will be there, but that yeah. You know, that closeness to Allah, that is our, like, that's our constant. Yeah. And that will get us through everything. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. And then we were talking about how, you know, when you see other people who are distressed and in anguish, and sometimes it is not in our power to alleviate it for them. Like, you know, somebody who's suffering from an illness, we cannot remove that. But we are, again, we are agents of Allah, so we can bring happiness to them. Mm. And it can be small things, but, you know, the effect and the benefit is so huge that the hadith that we came across was when the Holy Prophet says, whoever makes a believer happy has made me happy, and whoever has made me happy has made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy. So it's huge. It's, it's a small thing that we can do. It could be a small thing, and it's, the impact is so, so big. 
And, you know, and the fact that it's so easy to do that, to make Allah happy so easily, you know, in Dua Kumail, we say that, you know, oh, yasari ar oh, one who is quick to become happy. This is a perfect example that he becomes happy so quickly by our small action of just trying to bring happiness to another person. But we yes. actually think it takes quite a lot, doesn't it? Like when I read, you know, radiallahu anhum wa radu anhu, I think, wow, you know, who are the types of people that Allah is pleased with? But actually... It, it's not that lofty, it's not that far off. We can all become those people that Allah is pleased with by doing something really small, like smiling at someone or, you know, like just trying to make someone happy, giving them time, listening to them, yeah. all those things. Can Checking come. in a WhatsApp mess message, you know, that's just yeah. such easy, something so easy. Checking in with them. Yeah, yeah. That's all we have time for today. Um, as with, you know, last time, do try and make sure that you go through the rest of the dua in your own time answer the questions, do the suggested activity, um, which is actually looking at these practical implementations and then actually doing them. So we've talked a lot about them, but actually what can we do to practically implement this dua and putting that into action? And then of course the Kahoot quiz. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much everyone and inshallah see you for the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.